Remember when Saturday Night Live almost reunited the Beatles? Or when Sinead O'Connor got in trouble with the Pope? For a show that's been going strong for almost 50 years, it goes without saying that its history is riddled with all brands of controversy and intrigue. Well, isn't that special? <laughs> in 1974, Johnny Carson was the biggest moneymaker on television. According to The New Yorker, he brought NBC about $60 million a year, which earned him quite a bit of leverage when negotiating an extension on his contract to continue making The Tonight Show. The program aired weeknights at 11.30 p.m., and back then, NBC filled the time slot on Saturdays with a Tonight Show clip show called The Best of Carson. But when Carson told NBC he'd only make four new shows each week, moving The Best of Carson to a weeknight, he left NBC with a 90-minute hole in the Saturday night schedule. The network decided to try out a late-night variety show geared toward a young, hip audience. To run it, executives tapped 30-year-old Canadian comedy writer Lorne Michaels, best known for his work on an Emmy-winning Lily Tomlin special. It took Michaels a year to work out the format and find a cast of seven sketch comedians, but in October 1975, the show was ready to go. During its first season on TV, 1975 through 1976, the show wasn't actually called Saturday Night Live, as that title was already in use. Sportscaster Howard Cosell hosted an ABC primetime variety show with the name, and oddly enough, future SNL star Bill Murray was one of the stock players. But when that show was canceled, NBC snapped up the title, replacing the bland original NBC's Saturday Night. That's why at the beginning of each show, a performer says, Live from New York! And while the show's opening sequence now features the main cast and featured players' names read loudly and excitedly by Daryl Hammond, who replaced longtime announcer Don Pardo after his death in 2014, the SNL cast members weren't introduced individually during the first season. The obscure comedians were instead dubbed the not-ready-for-primetime players, but Dan Aykroyd, Chevy Chase, Jane Curtin, Gilda Radner, and the others wouldn't stay anonymous for long. Nowadays, the show is pretty much all comedy, with a couple of musical performances thrown in. But in the early years, Saturday Night Live was a true variety show. The Muppets were frequent guests on the late-night circuit in the mid-70s, so it only made sense to include them. But we're not talking about Kermit and the gang here. Instead, Jim Henson and his cohorts created a whole slew of new, monstrous, adult-oriented creatures for a segment called The Land of Gorch. I'm gonna stick my fingers in his ears and shake him off till he is dead. <laughs> It might have been the first and only time a Muppets project was not well received. Considered not as fresh and urgent as the SNL manic sketch comedy, the segment ground each show to a halt. And due to Writers Guild rules, the sketches couldn't be written by Muppets writers, leaving regular SNL writers to do it, and they resented the puppets for taking up valuable airtime. The Muppets were gone after the first season. For a Business Insider, here's the timetable for how an episode of SNL is produced. Monday, the guest host arrives at 30 Rockefeller Center in New York City, where SNL is shot. They go to Michael's office, where they talk to writers and cast members about their comedic strengths, impressions they can do, and other suggestions. Writers then pitch their ideas. Tuesday, as a holdover from the show's cocaine-fueled days in the 70s, writers spend all day and night writing their sketches. The host and a cast member also shoot short commercials to promote the episode. They're edited and put on the air within hours of being shot. Wednesday, the table read is at 4 p.m. Every proposed sketch is included, so it usually takes at least three hours. Then producers and the head writers determine which sketches are good enough. Thursday, at 6 a.m., builders begin constructing sets at a shop in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. At 30 Rock, the crew firms up plans for costumes, wigs, and makeup. Any pre-taped video bits are recorded. Friday, rehearsals are performed and rewrites are hashed out. Saturday, the sketch order is set and presented to a live audience at 8 p.m. Any last-minute changes happen by 11.30 p.m. when the show goes live. After one SNL season ends and another begins, at least a couple of veteran cast members decide to leave the series. That presents an opportunity for SNL brass to bring in new performers, which helps keep the show fresh in terms of comedic voices and styles. SNL talent scouts and producers find those next generation and emerging stars who might be a good fit for the show by casting a wide net. While they'll consider online comedians and take recommendations, comedy hotbeds like the Groundlings in Los Angeles or the Upright Citizens Brigade in New York often arrange showcases for top talent, and Michaels and other show staffers, writers, and cast members attend. If they like what they see, they invite the performers to an audition on the SNL stage. 
Hopefuls have 10 minutes to do stand-up or present at least two original characters and celebrity impressions. I'm Penelope Cruz. I'm always searching for the most perfect moisturizer. With more than a dozen performers and at least that many writers in direct competition with each other to fill just about an hour of sketch time, somebody is going to get left out. In his book, Gasping for Airtime, former cast member Jay Moore said he was so desperate to get a sketch on the air in 1995 that he stole a routine by comedian Rick Shapiro and turned it into O'Callaghan and Son Pub. Two months later, SNL fired Moore. And while Larry David eventually went on to co-create Seinfeld and star in Curb Your Enthusiasm, he had an uneventful spell as an SNL writer in 1984. Back then, only one of his sketches made it to air. An odd piece called Going Up. In it, an architect becomes frustrated that a client wants to make sure that the elevators in the new building have stools for elevator operators. David later recycled the bit for an episode of Seinfeld. Not bad. It's obvious which guest hosts SNL likes the most because they're the ones who keep coming back. Steve Martin, Alec Baldwin, Woody Harrelson, and Melissa McCarthy are a few who have meshed well with the program. On the other end of the spectrum, there are hosts who will likely never return because they were difficult to work with, obnoxious, or both. In a 1992 episode, host Nicolas Cage confides to Michaels that he fears he'll be the worst host in the show's history. Michaels replies, No, no, that would be Steven Seagal. Al Franken wrote that joke, but many SNL alumni, including David Spade, have named the martial arts actor the show's worst host. But according to Michaels, the worst was probably early TV star Milton Berle, who guested in 1979 and disrupted the show with mugging, ad-libbing of old and tired jokes, and arranged beforehand to have the studio audience give him a standing ovation at the end. Tina Fey, however, didn't beat around the bush when she told Howard Stern who she thought was the worst, Paris Hilton. While many of the show's performers come from an improv comedy background, it's forbidden to improvise on SNL. The show has to be planned down to the second to account for each sketch, musical performance, and a commercial break. But not every host and musical guest follows that rule, and many were subsequently banned. In 2003, Adrian Brody did an impromptu borderline racist bit with a Jamaican accent while introducing reggae singer Sean Paul. In 1996, Rage Against the Machine asked for two upside-down American flags to be hung on the stage. When producers said no, the band hung them up anyway. Stagehands tore them down just seconds before they were supposed to perform and their second song was cancelled. The musicians were escorted from the building before the episode had even finished. Send Dog of Cypress Hill claimed his group earned a ban after smoking marijuana during their SNL performance, and let's not forget Sinead O'Connor's infamous Pope incident in 1992. Just because an SNL episode airs, it doesn't mean it stays that way forever. Producers often tinker with shows for reruns, replacing a sketch that went poorly with a superior version recorded during dress rehearsal. That means some lost sketches only survive on DVD and streaming versions. One of them, Butt County Dance Party, aired in 1976. In the sketch, a small-town sheriff played by Dan Aykroyd hosts a TV dance show, and winners get to have their names run through a teletype machine to check for outstanding warrants. But when the machine malfunctioned, Aykroyd tried to improvise and told everyone to keep dancing, although there was no music. NBC cut to random stock footage of car crashes, then pulled the sketch from reruns. In another instance from 1985, NBC president Brandon Tartikoff appeared in a sketch to collect urine samples from cast members for drug testing, but it was later deemed to be in poor taste. In the reruns, it swapped out for an extra musical performance by Simple Minds. For decades, each episode of Saturday Night Live has basically followed the same format – a bunch of standalone sketches, a couple of musical performances, and weekend update somewhere in the middle. In 1986, that all went out the window, but just once, to cater to a very special guest. Acclaimed director Francis Ford Coppola was the host, and the through-line of the episode was that Coppola was directing the show. The credits were stylized like those of an art film, and the music was provided by that night's musical guest, avant-garde composer Philip Glass. Cheer star George Wendt was on hand to deliver the opening monologue and appeared in sketches, while Coppola didn't act in anything apart from appearing as himself, sitting in a director's chair and interrupting the show every few minutes to critique the actor's performances or other aspects of the production. Dennis, you can't do a satellite interview with Pinochet. It's too much like Ted, Ted Coppola. Coppola. Sorry, Coppola. Anyway, it's not original. He also appeared in vignettes with Michaels and cast member Terry Sweeney to discuss innovative ways to save the show, which NBC was actually considering canceling at the time. 
Many of the most popular SNL characters have been spun off into feature films, but very few of them have been financially successful. Some of these include The Blues Brothers and the classic Wayne's World. Does this guy know how to party or what? It's the $100 million plus box office take of the latter that encouraged the production of more and more SNL movies in the 1990s and early 2000s. A Night at the Roxbury offered a look at the backstory and home life of those unnamed guys, played by Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan, who bobbed their heads to Hathaway's What is Love and tried to pick up uninterested women in a series of sketches in the mid-1990s. It earned a respectable $30 million at the box office in 1999, and so did Superstar, about Molly Shannon's awkward schoolgirl character, Mary Catherine Gallagher. Other films didn't fare so well, it's Pat, revolving around Julia Sweeney's character Pat Riley, the joke being that people couldn't figure out the character's gender, barely saw release in 1994, nor did Al Franken's Stuart Smalley vehicle Stuart Saves His Family the following year. As of 2023, the last SNL-based movie to see a theatrical release was MacGruber in 2010. Not every single aspect of Saturday Night Live is produced as its live broadcast. Since the beginning of the show in the 1970s, pre-taped segments, short films, and commercial parodies have almost always been a part of the SNL format. Tom Schiller produced standalone films for SNL in its early years, such as the flash-forward death meditation, Don't Look Back in Anger. They're all dead. I'll tell you why. Because I'm a dancer. In the 70s, comedian and filmmaker Albert Brooks rejected Michael's offer to make him the show's permanent host and instead offered to create short films. Mockumentary master Christopher Guest also contributed short features as a cast member in the 80s. Robert Smigel's animated TV Funhouse anthology featuring the ex-presidents, fun with real audio, and the ambiguously gay duo broke up SNL episodes in the 2000s, and The Lonely Island brought more than just Andy Samberg to Saturday Night Live. They also brought comic rap videos and viral hits like Lazy Sunday and I'm on a Boat. In 2021, SNL brought on the internet comedy troupe Please Don't Destroy to produce semi-weekly videos for the show. Once they've finally made it into the cast of SNL, the worrying doesn't end for performers. They can and have been abruptly fired from the show. Damon Wayans told The Weekender of his 1985 to 1986 tenure, "...they didn't let me do what I wanted to do on SNL." He got so frustrated that he did something he knew would lead to his termination. He deviated from script and rehearsal and, in a live sketch, portrayed a police officer character as a flamboyant LGBTQ stereotype. In 1995, SNL cleaned house, in the wake of a blistering New York Magazine cover story that hailed the show's demise, and as ratings subsequently fell, Michaels fired nearly everyone, including major standouts like Adam Sandler and Chris Farley. David Spade, Tim Meadows, and a few others were spared. The next season, Michaels brought on new hires like Will Ferrell, Jim Brewer, and Sherry O'Terry. And in 1998, NBC executive Dick Ebersol, who helped develop SNL in the 70s, fired Weekend Update anchor Norm MacDonald, reportedly due to his constant jokes about a accused killer O.J. Simpson. Ebersol happened to be one of Simpson's friends. She exclaimed, he did it. Reach for comment, O.J. said, my mom was just guessing, I hadn't even told her yet. More recently, Taron Killam and Jay Farrow were both let go after six years on the show. Only a couple hundred performers have ever been full-fledged SNL cast members. It's an achievement unto itself for a young comedian, if not a launchpad to future entertainment world success. But some people's time with the show ended before it could even begin. During the 1980-1981 season, Emily Prager and Lori Metcalf joined SNL as featured players. A writer's strike ended the SNL season prematurely at 13 episodes, by which point Metcalf had appeared in only a few segments, and Prager hadn't appeared at all. They exited the cast shortly thereafter. Emmy Award-winning actor Catherine O'Hara actually joined SNL in the early 80s during a hiatus from Canada's SCTV, and quit a couple of weeks before the SNL season began airing, although she did go on to have a turn as a host in 1992. O'Hara told the Toronto Star, "...I hung out with some nice people, tried to come up with some ideas, but I never really felt involved." In September 2019, SNL announced that comedian and podcaster Shane Gillis had landed a spot in the cast. Within the week, footage of Gillis uttering slurs on his podcast, offensive to people of Chinese descent and to members of the LGBTQ community, surfaced online and went viral. Days later, before ever appearing on the show, Gillis was fired. According to the New York Post, six years after the Beatles split up in 1970, concert promoter Sid Bernstein offered the Fab Four a whopping $230 million 
to get back together and go on tour. The band members declined, but the cultural incident was fresh in the minds of Saturday Night Live viewers later that year. So Michaels went on camera in September 1976 and pleaded with the Beatles to reunite on his show and play three songs for a comically small amount of money. I told them I was authorized by NBC to pay them the sum of $3,000. That was $3,000 for just three songs. It was all a joke, but unbeknownst to Michaels at the time, two Beatles actually considered accepting. Paul McCartney and John Lennon happened to be together watching SNL on TV at Lennon's apartment when Michaels made his pitch. McCartney told Rock News Desk, John said, we should go down, just you and me. There's only two of us, so we'll take half the money. But it would have been work, and we were having a night off, so we elected not to go. Five years into SNL, Michaels needed a break. In case he departed entirely, he picked staff writer and cast member Al Franken to be his replacement. Two days before a discussion with NBC president Fred Silverman, Franken appeared in a weekend update segment called Limo for the Lamo, criticizing Silverman for charging NBC for car service despite the network's failures. Okay. Right. The guy's been here two years, and he hasn't done diddly squat. Okay, and he gets a limo. Now, that enraged Silverman and led to such animosity toward SNL that Michaels wound up leaving the show altogether. NBC appointed inexperienced TV producer Jean Dumanian to replace Michaels. Her first task, hire new performers, as most of the old ones left with Michaels. Dumanian hired stars like Eddie Murphy and Joe Piscopo while the show cycled through writers. During the 1980-81 season, SNL lost 30% of its audience while critics lamented the slide in quality. The 11th episode of the season featured an extended riff on the Who Shot JR storyline from Dallas, with cast member Charles Rocket faux shot. During the show's good nights, guest host Charlene Tilton asked a wheelchair bound Rocket how he felt. He said, It's the first time I've ever been shot in my life. I'd like to know who did it. <laughs> One episode later, NBC fired Dumanian. Soon after that, Rocket was let go as well. A writer's strike followed, and the season ended early. Saturday Night Live is a high-profile pinnacle of comedy, but it's not for everyone. Now best known for Strangers with Candy and BoJack Horseman, Amy Sedaris was performing her comic stage show One Woman Shoe in 1995 when Michaels approached her about replacing abruptly departed cast member Janine Garofalo. Sedaris told writer David Rakoff, It was everything I wanted. Maybe even three years earlier it would have been great. Right around the time she landed a breakout role on Friends in the mid-1990s, Jennifer Aniston met with Michaels and turned down the chance to be in the SNL cast. She recalled telling Michaels about the show's boys club atmosphere during an appearance on The Howard Stern Show. I didn't think I would like that environment. Johnny Knoxville passed on SNL in two different ways. Knoxville and a team of skateboarders put together a pilot of themselves performing wild, humorous pranks and stunts. That project aired on MTV as Jackass after Knoxville turned down a weekly spot for the concept on SNL because they'd have more control over the material on cable. SNL then asked Knoxville alone to join the cast. He told the Washington Times, It was at the point where I either say yes to my friends, where we had all the control, or yes to Saturday Night Live, where none of my friends were really going to be there, and I had no control. Saturday Night Live writers are unionized and part of the Writers Guild of America. When the organization goes on strike, it ends production on most scripted television series. Two such stoppages resulted in unique Saturday Night Live presentations made by SNL cast and writers and presented live, but never aired on TV. According to the War for Late Night book, when the 1988 writers' strike caused SNL to wrap up the 1987-88 season early, writers Robert Smigel and Bob Odenkirk took all the sketches they didn't think would ever make it into a broadcast episode of SNL. After recruiting future writers Conan O'Brien and Greg Daniels, the group put on the Happy Happy Good Show at a theater in Chicago. Among the sketches in the presentation was Chicago Superfans, which would later be a recurring SNL bit called Bill Swirsky's Superfans, responsible for the catchphrase. The bears. The bears. During the 2007-2008 WGA strike, the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York hosted a complete SNL episode for a live audience. With proceeds benefiting furloughed SNL staff, most of the show's regular cast at the time, including Fred Armisen, Seth Meyers, Daryl Hammond, Kenan Thompson, and Amy Poehler, participated. Michael Sarah served as guest host, and Yola Tango was the musical guest. Because of the writer's strike, the sketches were written months or years earlier, all of them consisting of things rejected for the TV version of SNL.
It's not uncommon to meet a romantic partner in the workplace, and Saturday Night Live seems to be the kind of place where people make lasting love connections. Star Wars favorite Carrie Fisher hosted SNL in 1978 and met Dan Aykroyd there, but according to Aykroyd, their romance began while filming The Blues Brothers. Scarlett Johansson hosted SNL in 2006 when Colin Jost was a writer on the show, and they worked on a sketch together in 2010 when Johansson returned. By 2017, they were an official couple. They married in 2020. And I met the love of my life here. Oh. Mary Sue. Writer-director Dave McCary helmed the SNL short Wells for Boys during an episode hosted by Emma Stone, whom he'd later marry. When Mad Men star John Hamm hosted SNL in 2008, he brought along co-star Elizabeth Moss for a cameo in a sketch, where she met fellow cast member Fred Armisen. The pair married in 2009 and split up in 2010. Cast member Cecily Strong dated featured player and writer Mike O'Brien in 2014. Pete Davidson met comedian Cassie David when her father Larry David hosted the show in 2015. Davidson broke things off in 2018 and days later began a relationship with Ariana Grande, whom he'd first met when she appeared on SNL in 2016. Davidson later enjoyed a romance with Kim Kardashian, whom he connected with after her 2021 hosting stint. Alongside the ever-changing cast of actors and comedians on Saturday Night Live, each week is the show's house band, a collective of experienced professional musicians spanning many genres. A number of major stars have spent some time playing the SNL opening and closing themes, jazzy pop interstitial tunes, and sketch accompaniment music as required. Howard Shore, who'd later go on to win Oscars for two The Lord of the Rings movies, wrote the SNL theme song and served as the show's first musical director, following collaborations with Lorne Michaels on Canadian variety TV shows. The 1972 Toronto production of the musical Godspell involved future SNL greats Gilda Radner and Martin Short, while Paul Schaefer played in the orchestra. Before joining the SNL cast as an actor and before a 33-year stint as David Letterman's band leader, Schaefer played keyboards in the SNL band. Guitarist G.E. Smith became moderately famous as a member of Daryl Hall and John Oates' backing band during their hit-making days in the 1980s, but needed work when the duo called for an indefinite hiatus in 1985. That's when Michaels returned to SNL after his own hiatus, and according to The Morning Call, he asked Smith to be the show's band leader. Still photography comprises a big part of both the look and flow of Saturday Night Live. In transitioning to and from commercial breaks, SNL puts up photos of each episode's guest host, generally of a humorous and whimsical nature. Since 1999, SNL official photographer Mary Ellen Matthews is the person responsible for those bumper celebrity portraits. Matthews takes the job seriously, aiming to make the host comfortable enough to let loose and be creative. She told Vulture, I like to make it as easy as possible for everyone. I don't want them overthinking this part of the show. It should be super fun and super easy. It's an open invitation to get kooky. The SNL production schedule is so tightly packed that Matthews and a handful of costume and prop assistants get no more than 90 minutes over the span of two days to shoot an entire episode's bumpers, about four or five different visual scenarios, which makes proper planning key. Matthews added, We try to find out who's hosting as far in advance as possible so we can start thinking about it. In 2021, Lorne Michaels told reporters that he might be winding down work on the comedy institution. My plan is to be here for the 50th, and by that point, I really deserve to uh, wander off. Michaels doesn't want SNL to end with his exit, however, and he claims to have secretly selected his successor. Less than a year later, Charlemagne the God reported on his show, Hell of a Week, a rumor that NBC may pull the plug on SNL when Michaels leaves after season 50. Hell of a Week guest Keenan Thompson, the longest tenured cast member in the history of the show, didn't deny the gossip. There, there could be a lot of validity to that rumor because 50 is a good number to stop at, you know what I'm saying?